Today is a special Sunday in the church calendar. Today is Trinity Sunday. So every year, the Sunday after Pentecost is set aside as Trinity Sunday. It's all about kind of celebrating, but also looking intently at this profound doctrine that is at the very center of our faith. That one God has revealed himself in three different persons. Now, as a minister, I'm here to tell you that I don't fully understand the doctrine of the Trinity, but I love the fact that this mystery about our God is part of our faith. It's something to wrestle with and journey with, and there is real life to be found in unpacking the mystery of the Trinity. So my prayer for today is, may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit meet with us and minister to us as we gather in His name today. Amen. But I'm going to ask Holly if she would come forward and share our scripture reading for today. Romans 8, verse 12 to 17. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by, if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you, will be, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now, we call Him Abba Father, for His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share His glory, we must also share His suffering. So, like I mentioned a bit earlier, today is Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday is always the first Sunday after Pentecost. And so it is a day set aside every single year to reflect on the theology and the doctrine of God. Trinity is this idea of a three-in-one God, a triune God. To break up that word triune gives us some understanding of what it is we're talking about. Tri meaning three, un meaning a unity or a oneness. It's God who is one God, but revealed in three different persons. And if that's something that you're finding hard to understand, then that's good. And you are in good company. I'm glad you're getting something of a headache. This is uh, intellectually stretching stuff. And I want to tell you that wars have been fought over trying to come to grips with this idea of Trinity. It is hard to understand, and I'm not sure in my 12 years of theological study that I grasp it fully or appropriately. So it is okay if some of it remains a mystery. In fact, I quite like the idea that our God, the God who we need to help us and to guide us, is so big that we don't fully understand it. In fact, if we did fully understand it, If our brains could fully comprehend him, then he might not actually be big enough to really help us when we need it. What makes things perhaps a little bit more tricky is that this word Trinity doesn't appear once in Scripture. The word Trinity is not a biblical word or a biblical term. In fact, Trinity is a doctrine made by human beings. Some people have some issues with that. But I think it's worthwhile unpacking this mystery. What you will find in Scripture, though you won't find the word Trinity, is you will find what scholars call the Trinitarian formula. Okay? Trinitarian formula. What they mean by that is there are many places in the New Testament where the New Testament writers reflect all three persons of the Trinity in their writings. One of the great examples of it is the Great Commission. From Matthew 28, we, I think we, we read this last week, where Jesus says, you know, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three members of the Trinity are mentioned. Or what about, you know, the way we end off every single Sunday service? We join hands and we say the benediction. 
Now that comes from the Bible. That's a verse from 2 Corinthians is it 13 verse 14. Where it says, Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. You see, there is evidence of the Trinity in Scripture, even though the word Trinity is not used. It's trying to encapsulate this idea of a God who is so big, it's hard for us to fully understand it. I've heard people try and describe the Trinity in terms of water. And I used to kind of like this this, uh, analogy. You know, that water is H2O, whether it is in liquid form as water, or solid form as ice, or in uh, vapor form or gas form as water vapor. It's still water. And so God is still God, even if He reveals Himself to us in different ways. What I've come to enjoy more recently, in terms of trying to get my head around the Trinity, is that I, Dylan, am one person, but I can be revealed in different ways. So to some people, I am a pastor. To other people, I am a father. To other people, I am a husband. Hopefully only one person I am a husband. (laughs) It reflects the different parts of relationship I have. And so maybe God, who is one God, reveals himself in different ways depending on where we are and what kind of help we need or what kind of teaching or movement God is trying to enact in our lives. One person revealed in three distinct ways. I like that. That for me kind of gets to the heart of this Trinitarian idea. Is that God is one God. He is always God. But he relates to us differently depending on what we need or where we are. Now for many people, this whole idea of Trinity is something that just doesn't sit well with them. Something they just don't fully comprehend or compute. People have fought battles, religious battles over this. You, you could say today that some churches and denominations almost seem to highlight one part of the Trinity over others. That would be a fair assessment. But let none of that take away from the truth that God is clearly so desperate to be near to us and to reveal himself to us that he does it in a variety of ways to make sure that we can connect with him. I love that. And if that's all my small brain can comprehend, then that is fine with me. There's no need to go into some theological debate or fight some war over a man-made doctrine when all I need to do is accept that God loves me enough to reach out to me in a variety of ways. I think that kind of thinking is actually what Paul is on about in our reading from Romans chapter 8. Notice that in our reading today, Paul makes no attempt to teach about the doctrine of the Trinity. He's not trying to unpack who is God and what Jesus is and what the Holy Spirit comes to do. But he mentions all three members of the Trinity in that short passage that we read today. He's not giving a detailed explanation of theology. He's merely stating how God can be there and support and be with his people. Now theology and doctrinal arguments have their place. And often they can be very well thought out. But they can leave us feeling like a bit dry and empty. Because God is not a bunch of words on a piece of paper. He is a person to be experienced. It's a relationship to be had. It's a connection to be felt. Not just something to understand in your head. God is a person who is dynamic and always at work and always moving in our lives. And so that's actually what I want to leave you with today. You know, the the overwhelming thought I've had this week as I've been reflecting on this passage is, you know, Paul, this amazing hero of our faith, a man who almost single-handedly took the message of Christ outside the land of Israel to the rest of the Greek-speaking world. He was a man of incredible energy and strength, a man who faced all kinds of opposition, He was arrested, he was stoned, he was whipped, he was shipwrecked twice, he was bitten by a snake. This man lived an incredibly difficult life. 
Yet he always found the strength to keep going. He always found the passion to keep on spreading Christ's love. He always found this vigor to keep going no matter what obstacles came his way. I'm left thinking to myself, how did he do it? Where did he get that strength from? Where did that drive and that passion come from? How did he go and keep going with such a good attitude and so much joy in his heart? And then when I read this passage again, Romans chapter 8 from verse 12 to 17, I realized Paul had a profound experience of God in his life. He knew the Trinity. He experienced what it was like to live by the Spirit. He knew what it was to be a son of God the Father. He loved this idea that Jesus was his role model and guide, but also someone that he could share experience with. What Jesus went through, Paul was proud that he could say, I also suffer with Christ and for Christ. He was so connected to God that no matter what else happened, he was able to remain focused on his goal, filled with the passion and strength of God, and keep on doing it. And so today, on this Trinity Sunday, what I really want to leave with you is not some theological idea to think about in your mind, but a reality-based experience of God revealing himself to you in different and distinct ways, the three persons of the Trinity. And so, as we see in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes about this idea of living with the Spirit or living by the Spirit. Now, Paul starts off this section by speaking about, you know, actually there are two ways to live. There's life by the flesh. And when Paul writes about flesh, he speaks about living with a a worldly, sinful nature. You know, you don't have to live life God's way. You can give in to the natural desires of your body. Stuff that wants to serve me and do whatever I want and get my way in this world. In fact, many people live that way. Paul would call that living by the flesh, by the ways of this world. But he's very clear. He says it leads to death. Things must die when we live that way. And it might be you, yourself, who dies, but it might be the end of a relationship. It might be the end of a friendship, the end of your hopes or your aspirations. When you live poorly, it comes back to bite you. Or you can live by the Spirit. What does Paul mean by that? He means that when you believe in Jesus, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. This guiding force, the Spirit of God can lead and guide you and show you how to live. He can orient your whole life around God and what God wants from you. Live by the Spirit. And so Paul is the example of this. He lived his life by the Spirit and he calls on us to do the same. To be inspired and led by God. To listen to that inner voice of God that leads and guides you into how you should live and what you should do. That's the spirit that we need to follow. You know, for a long time, I I would often doubt whether I really had the spirit within me. I'd think things like, is that really what God wants me to do? Or is that what I think God wants me to think, so I'm thinking it now? Can you imagine... The headache of that rolling round and round and round in my mind. Till I came to just blindly accept, actually, the Bible says it, it's true. The Holy Spirit is inside of me. So when I get those ideas, they are inspired by God. Where does that thought come from to phone that person? It's the Spirit leading me. Where does that prick of my conscience come from? It says, "Uh uh-uh, Dylan, you're heading down a wrong path here. Stop it now. I've come to accept that that is the Spirit. And I can choose to live by that spirit, receive that guidance, or run after things that I want in my own way. There's a great phrase in our Romans 8 reading today, from verse 15. It says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. I love what Paul is saying. Saying that a life by the Spirit is a life disconnected from fear. So some people were saying to Paul, I don't want to live by the Spirit because then God's going to take control of my life. 
He's going to make me a slave where I have to be this robot who just blindly follows what he says. Paul says it's not like that. The Spirit doesn't make us a slave so that we are afraid of our ruler and our master. The Spirit instead makes us sons and daughters of God. Makes us part of God's family. It's not a power dynamic, it's a relationship of love. Which means when we live by the Spirit, we can live fearlessly. We can be reminded that our identity is that we are children of God and nothing can change that. Think of, you know, like when you're on the playground as a youngster and you would get into a fight with other kids and the fight would be about, well, my dad is bigger than your dad. My dad's muscles are so much bigger than your dad's muscles. My dad can pull a whole car. That's what we have. We don't have to be afraid because our dad, God the Father, is the biggest. And he is on our side. And he is for us. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be scared by whatever challenges come against us. Life by the Spirit reminds us that we are God's. Therefore, insecurity and fear and anxiety can be banished because God is our Father. The Spirit is leading and guiding us. There is nothing to be afraid of because God will get you through it. And that brings me on to this idea of relating to God as Father. Okay, so we live by the Spirit. We also need to know that God is our Father. Now think about this for a moment. Paul grew up as a good little Jewish boy. He was raised in the ways and the laws of Judaism. In that faith, you couldn't even say the name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah, depending on how you want to pronounce it. You weren't allowed to express that name because you didn't want to take the Lord's name in vain. And so there was this almost distant, fearful relationship between the Jews and their God. <laughs> Then Jesus comes along and he teaches his followers how to pray. And he teaches them to pray, Our Father. It is a transforming concept that this God, the most powerful being in the universe, the everlasting one above all else, lets us address him as Father. Paul is explicit in how he expresses this notion in Romans chapter 8. He says that the spirit within us allows us to call God Abba Father. Now that Abba is from Aramaic, the language of the day in Israel. And it kind of is colloquial. It's not a formal term for father. It's actually a bit like our daddy or papa. It's the kind of word a small toddler would shout out to their dad when they see their dad coming home from work. He also adds in the Greek word for father. Paul is trying to express to us that, hey, do you know? Have you worked this out? God, the most powerful being in the universe, lets you call him dad. It's a relationship of love and connection. And yes, God is powerful and sovereign and in control and everlasting, but he gives you unparalleled access to him. I always think of that story of, of a powerful king who would never let any one of his subjects disturb him while he was holding his court. If anyone walked into the room, they would be thrown in jail or maybe even worse. But there was always one in the kingdom who fearlessly walked into the king's court. Who was that? The king's little daughter. She had access. She could go into that room whenever she wanted and march right on up to the throne and climb up into the king's lap and give him a big hug. Why? Because that was her dad. She had that kind of access. How did Paul get through all the things he faced? How did he find strength to deal with all the things that scared him and shook him to his core? He knew that the most powerful being in the universe gave him access like a son to a father. We can run into the arms of God whenever we want. We can bring to him any fear, any worry, any concern. 
We never have to be worried that he's going to chase us away or say, don't bother me now with your little problems. He says we are his children, his sons and his daughters. We can relate to him as our dad. Now, some of us have struggles with relating to God as father because of our own experience of earthly fathers. And some people say, no, that's why I can't call God my father because I struggle with it. I want to challenge you to remember that God is the perfect revelation of God. <laughs> Earthly fathers will let you down. That's going to happen. But that doesn't mean we can't relate to God as Father. He is the best expression of that fatherly parental love. So run to Him. Go to Him for support. Find your strength in His loving and strong embrace. We get to relate to Him as Father. And then finally, we have this whole idea of being co-heirs with Jesus. So we live by the Spirit. We relate to God as Father. We celebrate that we are His children. But thirdly, we are to remember that we are co-heirs with Christ. You know, Paul was a wonderful uh, exponent of this idea that to be a Christian, you are a follower of Christ. And Paul used those words often in his writings. If you read through his epistles, he often says, Paul, a follower of Jesus. He shaped his whole life around following the example of Christ. He was someone who was trying to do the things that Christ did, say the kinds of things that Christ would say, reach out in love and change people's lives as Jesus would do. And that's much what our job is today, to follow Christ, to live and speak and be like him. But Paul also understood that being a follower of Jesus means we are to probably experience the same kinds of things that Jesus would experience. Jesus was rejected. He was persecuted. People came against him. And the Bible is full of uh, kind of teachings about how we should expect the same. Life as a Christian is not easy. It's a challenge. You will face opposition. It may be in the form of full-blown persecution, as in some parts of the world. Maybe for us it will be being ostracized or ridiculed by friends or family. There will be some kind of opposition. But that doesn't mean we aren't to live as Christians. Because we will find the strength that we need in God himself. Paul is very good at explaining this. He says, yeah, we will share in his sufferings. Then he also says we will share in his reward. How did Paul live and do and face up to all he faced? He was hell-bent on trying to follow Jesus, but he also knew that his way of living here on earth was earning a reward he would never be able to fully comprehend. The reward of the glory of what lies beyond this grave was a motivating factor for Paul. He knew he would go through tough times, but he knew none of that compared to the glorious riches prepared for him in heaven. He even uses the words that we will be co-heirs with Christ. So you get how Paul's thinking, hey? We live by the Spirit. We know that God is our Father. We are His children. Jesus is our example of how we should live. But you know, Jesus was a son of God. So whatever Jesus is going to inherit, we will also inherit as children of God, as sons and daughters of His. It means that one day we will be with Jesus. We will have the freedom and the glory of heaven. We'll have all the riches that Jesus has will be ours as co-heirs, equal inheritors of all that is in store for him. It's a profound thought that everything that God is willing to give to Jesus, he is willing to give to us. It doesn't take away from the challenges you will face or the difficulties you must endure, or the sadnesses you will experience, but it does give you a hope to hold on to, a hope to live with, a living hope, as Peter mentions in his writings. And so, you know, where the rubber hits the road for me is, you know, we can on a day like this, try and get our head around the theology of the Trinity, and try and understand the doctrine that many people far more intelligent than me have been trying to unpack as the work of their life. Or, 
we can kind of sit back and just accept the glorious truth of the Trinity. That it is to be experienced even if not fully understood. So take joy today from the fact that you can live by the Spirit. That the presence of God is so close it is actually already inside of you. To lead you and guide you and strengthen you. May you be comforted by the notion that whatever you face, you can run into the arms of God for strength and comfort and support. The God of the universe is your Father and you have unparalleled access to Him. So go to Him. Ask Him for help. Plead for His intervention. Sit in His lap and just feel the warmth of His his embrace if that is what you need. And then know that we have Jesus as our model, as our one to follow. And remember that what Jesus will inherit, so will we as co-heirs with Christ. That thought, that knowledge of the relationship of God with him, gave Paul all that impetus and energy and strength to change the course of human history. He understood that God was with him and for him, and it made all the difference to him. And so for us on this Trinity Sunday, may we receive this knowledge as an incredible gift. The presence of God always with us, the access we have to his power, and the promise of the hope and the reward we have in him. May that be fuel for your life, give you energy to what you're facing up to, comfort for your trials, and an example to follow in how you should live. And may in that way, this Trinity Sunday be a blessing to you. Amen. And so, Lord Jesus, on this Trinity Sunday, we don't want to get caught up in theology and doctrine. Lord, we'd rather get caught up in the glorious truth of your relationship with us, in experiencing the living and active God at work in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to know and to live by your Spirit, to be guided and motivated by you who are alive within us. Help us, Lord, to know that we can turn to you, our Heavenly Father, as a source of comfort and strength and help, whatever it is that we are going through, whatever it is that we are facing. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you set for us an example, a practical way of how to live out our lives for you here on earth. So help us, Lord, to follow you, to speak as you would speak, to act as you would act in our lives. And we are thankful, Lord, that in all of this, we are assured of the glorious promise of the reward of heaven. And we can live with hope here and now, despite what we face, because of what we have to look forward to in you. We pray, Lord, that we would take these thoughts with us and they would be a source of real strength and encouragement for us. And that is what we pray for. In the name of Jesus. Amen.